so, yes, uh, we've come from the Highlands of Perth, right? to come down to tell you all about uh, the work that my Young Archaeologist Club has been doing. Um, we started off, just so you know, in February this year. Um, we had an idea as the Year of Young People at the Crown Centre to start a Young Archaeologist Club. Um, we decided this was the year to do it, because um, out of all the years to do it, what better year to do it? Um, the aim of the club really here is to, is to try and take the kids that are interested in archaeology, heritage and museum studies and with this really rich um, information we have around the content in terms of the archaeology is just feed that interest, just, just really take it and grow it as much as we can. Um, and ultimately, tell them just how fun it can be um, because a lot of archaeology can go very serious but actually there's a lot of fun um, and there's some fantastic stories that we can tell with the archaeology. Um, so, we've been running it every month, every two weeks, we've been meeting up, um, and um, we've been running every two, two weeks, uh, we've done a ton of stuff, basics of archaeology, survey, recording, uh, excavation as well, we've been up to um, the hill fort over at King Seat, we've done a bit of digging there, um, we've done some drone survey, as you can see here, with a drone to show them aerial photography and how that works as well. We've even done a bit of bronze casting, a bit of sorting, um, and we have a fantastic uh, resource at the Crown Centre in terms of a museum as well. So actually getting these kids to hold original artefacts, record them, draw it, doing what I like to call real archaeology, made up fake stuff that looks a bit like archaeology. Um, so, um,
So yeah, we had this, this is the original um, plot from 1922 map here. As you can see, when the Reverend gave it me, I was a little um, shocked by its condition. Uh, so it was fully recorded and everything, trying to save that information. Um, and that was the first sort of written information we had on the church. Um, so, work so far. Um, we took the churchyard and we broke it down to sites. Uh, different areas to help work as it goes through. I had the kids decide where they should break it down with a bit of hint from myself as to where to go. Um, and this was the uh, agreed uh, areas that we should be working on. Um, now, the first areas surveyed are these ones around here um, because uh, these are the ones, this one here is the one that is missing off the plots. So the plot map of the church had all the plots here recorded but this was absent, so we were able to see this was the first place to look into for the study. Now, how we did it was every Saturday morning in the summer, we would go to the graveyard and we would get this sheet. We would fill it out, but first we would fill out where it was. First we would fill out where it was, Canmore Graveyard. Then we would measure the height, the length, and the width. Then we would see which way, to, which way it was facing, north, east, south, or west. Then we would see which number in the line it was, for example, 28 or 31. And then we would see this little maker's mark on the bottom corner. Then we would figure out what it was made from. Most of them were made out of granite, but a few of them were made out of sandstone, which was pretty cool. And then we would see if it was engraved or embossed. Then we would write down the whole inscription, which would have their name, their date of birth, and when they died. And then we would drew, then we would draw a really quick little sketch of what it looked like. And then there was this little box which was called remarks, which if there was anything else in the if there was anything else in on the gravestone you thought looked important, you would write that in there. So, uh, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, so, as we made our way through, um, we actually, which was quite an amazing part of this whole uh, project, was found a handful of headstones uh, which were actually incredibly interesting figures uh, in terms of the local heritage in the community. Um, the first one was a Mr. James Ferguson Wiley. Now, I don't know if you remember that this morning, there was a mention of the clearances of Glen Quake. This man was the one that did that. Uh, he was the factor of the other down. Now, Connor, I believe, has something to tell you about uh, James Ferguson and Wiley. So, basically, it was the fact that um, and his headstone was placed right from front, big, grand thing, high status individual. Um, and the best part of it was um, a local um, member of the Bedalban Heritage Society actually sent us the entire scripted letter uh, that uh, James sent to the Bedalban when encouraging the Highland Clearances. Um, and I think Connor has some quotes. Yes. Some very derogatory quotes about the Highland Clearances. This, and we did a speak and a talk about this at the end of one of our sessions, and I think this went down. The most interesting part of the entire thing, actually, if I'm honest. Um, Connor, would you like to read some of the derogatory quotes? Inferior policies. Thank you 
so much. So this, this guy's actually incredibly important, significant to the local history of the place. Um, and there he is in the churchyard. And just to the add to this, the Reverend didn't even know uh, this gentleman was buried there. So local history, one of the most important figures, a villain of the piece, no doubt. I think uh, his insults were, there was a long list of them, we won't go into them all, but um, very important little figure. And the story behind it really brings out, you know, just a stone, but here's the story that, that interests everything. Another one was, uh, um, was um, this gentleman, well, gentleman, he was a quite a sad story actually, um, but one of the last headstones we'll point out is, is this one here, which Caitlin will tell you all. It's Dilly, Sion's infant son. The infant son of the last Maharaja. M Maharaja. She's been practicing that all the time, as you see. Of the Sikh Empire was buried in the Kenmore graveyard. He died only a day, only a day old at a leap stayed in Taymouth Castle. A renovated memorial was put in place in 2008 to commemorate the son of Dilip Sain by the Anglo Sikh Heritage Trust. Dilip Sain conver converted to Christianity and was so fondly liked in the area, he was given the moniker at the Black Prince of Perthshire. He, he was a very important figure in history, with close ties to the local community, who was actually in line to inherit the Sikh Empire which ultimately fell to the East Indian Trading Company. Fantastic, thank you, Kate. Um, so, we have not finished this work. As you can see, we've got a lot more to get on with. Um, we've currently done to 193 left headstones. There's 290 left to do. But with what we've done so far, we have been able to get some of the results. Um, section 1, which was this area here, um, it's been quite difficult to look at because we haven't got the complete picture of the, the back section yet. So this one is finished and polished off, but there is a lot more work to come on this. More importantly, in section two, which was completely brand new, um, comparing from 1923, was not recorded at all. Um, and we opened it, we found out this was opened up in 1956, um, with the earliest grave that was there. Um, it was also um, towards in terms of development, it started here with the earliest graves and then it carried on along towards the front of the churchyard and then the latest graves come back along the wall here. Uh, the other area we were able to identify was section 4, which is extensive use of burials from 99 onwards. So this is the latest section. Um, so we're able to see exactly when this was opened up and started to be used just from the, the, the recording of all the headstones. Um, again, we can see that this developed from here and then carried on along that way. So there we go. Now the next step we've got to do is we've got to record the entire section three, uh, which is the big one in the back. So this is 290 headstones, which I think we'll manage in the next three months. Um, and we will compare the development of this section to the others, try and tie it in in terms of its chronology to the areas here, where it develops along, um, and we'll also highlight the biggest thing here is to highlight the headstones that are under threat. These are the oldest headstones on the site. What we're going to be doing is a full condition report on every single headstone so we can actually formally say this needs care, this needs care, and this needs care as well. Um, eventually, we'll publish all this and we will present this to the local heritage society as well as we are doing today. And then when we've done all that, we will find our next project. So if anybody has any thoughts or something to bring to us, um, come back to me in six months' time, maybe, when I've recovered. Um, yeah. And we will go through with the Young Archaeologist Club the next archaeological project and we will publish it as well. So, the biggest thing for me here is that what we've done with these kids here, if you just want to stand up, what we've done with these kids here is community archaeology. Uh, we have pulled in the local heritage society, we have a woman that comes every single week, um, and more importantly than that, we are based here at the Crown. We are a local museum, we only became a museum as of October last year and what we've been doing here is we have been bringing ourselves into the local community um, which is something in the past we have never done um, in the area and what we're doing now is making ourselves relevant as it is which for a local community is, is uh, for a small museum starting out it's very important to make yourself relevant to this local community um, and 
if nothing else, the stories that we found are really quite important for the heritage of this place because we don't have that, you know, just take it back very briefly, that is a stone. It's really irrelevant. The story of the Black Prince of Persia that goes with that is what makes it relevant. And that story is what is encouraging these kids to get interested in their heritage and to continue on with that heritage. And our local primary, our local, primary school, our local high school has over a thousand, it's 1,200 pupils and one history teacher for everything. So these clubs like this and this heritage and, and driving this importance is the only way I personally feel that I would feel that because club like this, um, that we can continue to keep uh, kids interested in heritage and ultimately become archaeologists in the future. Um, I love the story earlier about the kid that found the first bit of silver and he had the cheapest belt detector. Now, you tell me he won't end up being an archaeologist. And, um, these are the sorts of things that do this. Uh, importance, I can't stress it enough. So, thank you very much. <laughs>